Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. Thankful for the opportunity that you've given us to feast upon your word. I just ask that you would filter out all the foolishness, but seal to our hearts that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. It's a nice day here in southeastern Oklahoma. I'm standing here on an old bridge by an old river that, that runs close by our place. You can uh, you can take and hook a, a, a fist size piece of liver on a treble hook and throw it out here and catch a big mud cat. We've been studying together in the epistle to the Romans verse by verse and in our last study we left off at verse 4 of chapter 10 Romans 10 verse 4 for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes and I don't not sure if I pointed this out in my previous video but the word law there is is not the law it's not articulated it's just law the word the is not there in the original text. However, I have to admit here that, that in the Greek, as, as, as in the English, there are certain constructions where the definite article is not necessary, and the absence of the definite article does not infer the presence of the indefinite. An example would be if I said I want to be president, every one of you would know that I mean the president the definite article is inferred we could suggest it is uh, so certain here that it's speaking of the mosaic law that the definite article isn't needed however the definite article will be seen in the following verse verse 5 and so it appears in verse 5 but it doesn't in verse 4 and that's what caught my attention I've spent some time thinking about studying through this meditating praying about this particular text and uh, so I apologize for the delay in uploading this video so I've been busy with that uh, plus trying to repair some of the storm damage from that's occurred in our area as a result of the hailstorm. So the definite article will be seen in the following verse, verse 5. Therefore, my position on this, and I don't ask anyone to agree with me, is that the word law is referring to the principle of law, any law, all law, any means whereby we try and attain or maintain righteousness on a human level by works, human effort. In Romans 8, uh, 3 and 4, by the finished work of Christ, the righteousness of the law has already been fulfilled in us. Verse 5, for Moses describes the righteousness which is of the law. So now we see the word law is articulated, the law, and this is commonly taken as being the Mosaic law. The context confirms this to be the Mosaic law in the phrase, for Moses describes, you know, and as a Gentile, the only way that I could have approached God was through a Jewish priest. But Christ fulfilled that law. The law has ended for you who are in Christ. The common view being that that, that mediation, your communion with, with God is, is no longer through law and a Jewish priest but through Jesus Christ. But the church was never given the Mosaic Law to begin with. As a Gentile I had no approach to God. Yet, because the New Testament clearly says, lie not one to another, 
I insist that the word law in verse 4 as opposed to the law of verse 5 is a clear indication that Christ is the end of, of, of law, both of both law as well as the law, since the church is made up of both Jew and Gentile. But whichever position one takes on this, the fact is we are not under law, but grace. I do not believe that verse 1, and I, I think I pointed this out in a previous video. Now this may come across as somewhat heartless, but I'm just going by what the text says. I do not believe that verse 1 describes God's heart for people who are going to hell. No, these are elect people who don't have this truth, or at least they haven't accepted it. They are redeemed. They are God's elect. Surely, that verse isn't saying that he wants those whom he has cursed, those whom he says that he hates, vessels of wrath prepared aforehand for destruction. And God said that, I didn't. That he wants these persons redeemed. That that verse is saying he wants these persons redeemed. We basically still have our feet in chapter 9. I can't take verse 1 as an appeal to people headed for hell. God's desire is that you be saved because you're His. Now, I think something needs to be said about the phrase to everyone who believes because that phrase is seriously misunderstood by much of modern evangelism today. It can only be referring to all the redeemed who believe because as we have been in instructed up to this point, as we've seen throughout the entire study in Romans, only redeemed people can believe. And the context is dealing with the salvation of God's people. The chapter began with our seeing the Holy Spirit's desire for His people Israel. And my position, and I don't ask that you agree with me, is that the text is not speaking of Israelites whom God has yet to redeem, but those whom He has redeemed, whom God desires, believe. And that if they do not consciously exercise belief, they are not delivered. And I've spent some time differentiating between redemption and salvation. And that if they do not consciously exercise that faith, they're not delivered. But they are still redeemed. The strong desire of God's heart that is being ex expressed in this passage is that His people will believe and be delivered. So it matters that you believe. It matters so much that I'm willing to spend whatever time I have to teach the Word of God to you, God's redeemed people, because I want you to know that you're delivered from the law. You're delivered from human merit. You're delivered from the fear of death. You have the peace of God that passes understanding. There's so much good news. But if you do not have that truth regarding deliverance, and I'm assuming that you're redeemed, I do not believe that you can take those scriptures to mean that you're going to hell. Multitudes of Christians for whom Christ died do not believe very much truth that leads to deliverance. That's just the fact of the matter. And that is the position that I take on this. I see in the text a group of redeemed people, Israel, who are not benefiting because they are not believing unto the salvation that is available to them. And I believe the same is true within the church. Many scratch around in the garbage trying to become righteous when it was already done in Christ. He fulfilled the law. The law does not apply to you. I don't believe that we should rush through this passage of Scripture. I want to take a little time. I, I think we're on hollowed ground. I'm not going to do a good job. I wish I could and 
and go through the Word of God thinking about the finished work of Christ, which in theological circles is called the Atonement. And I'm going to do that by starting through the New Testament. Now, most of you should be familiar with these verses. If you're not, just contact me, and I'll be happy to, to, to send them to you. In Romans 8.29, we are glorified through the finished work of Christ. In Romans 8.38, there is no separation because of Christ Jesus our Lord. In Matthew, Christ came to fulfill the law. Matthew 5. In Matthew uh, 18, the finished work of Christ was to save those who were lost. Matthew 20 and, and 1 Timothy 2, he came to give himself a ransom for the elect. In John chapter 5, he came to finish God's work. And in John 17, he says he finished it. In Romans chapter 3 and in 1 John 2, the finished work of, of Christ included propitiation, satisfaction. Propitiation speaks of satisfaction. And that's where the, the theologians were generations ago. God is satisfied. In Romans 5, because he was delivered because of our offenses, we have peace with God. Peace with God. He was delivered because of our offenses. That's why God delivered him. And he was raised again because we were made righteous. That's why it's called the finished work of Christ. And because of that work, we have peace with God. There is no judgment. Oh, you, 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 will, you will give an accounting for how you built on Christ. But there is no judgment for sin. I can't even put into words the wonder of the fact that we have peace with God. In Romans 5.9, we're justified through the finished work of Christ. In 5.19, we are made righteous by the obedience of Christ. In Romans 8.1, we have no condemnation. In 1 Corinthians 5 and Ephesians 2, He's our substitute. And don't miss the importance of substitution. Christ didn't die to make something possible. That's modern evangelism. That he did something and, and you can come and, and take some money out of that bucket and pay your sin debt. Christ died in your place. He was your substitute. When the scriptures speak of Christ dying for you, the word means on your behalf or in your place. If Christ died in your place, how could you die? Well, you can't. How could he hold anything against you? He was your substitute. His dying in our place is a finished transaction. He will not, cannot, die again. In 1 Corinthians 15, because of Christ's death for you, you have victory. You triumph in all situations. In Galatians 4, you're involved in God's inheritance. Somebody dies and the relatives scramble around trying to get a portion of that inheritance. Imagine you're an heir of God, a joint heir with Christ. In Ephesians 1, Hebrews 9, 1 Peter 1, in the finished work of Christ, you are redeemed, ransomed. Christ bought you. You were redeemed with a price. And that price was the precious blood of Christ. And what did he buy? Something to throw away, something to cast aside, something to discard, or something that was so precious to him that he paid everything that he had. Redemption is a finished transaction. These are things people need to know. This has to do with salvation. And it is God's desire that we be saved, His people be saved. 
in Ephesians 1, Colossians 1, Colossians 2, you have forgiveness for sin. Not once in the scriptures are you ever, ever counseled to ask God to forgive your sins. And yet Christians by the millions do it. Is God a liar? When he says he's forgiven you all sins, all sins, and he's forgiven you all trespasses, are we to take that lightly? Is it not showing disrespect to God not to believe Him? Dearly beloved, you are forgiven all trespasses, all sins. Ephesians and Colossians, 1 John uh, 1 9 seem to be in conflict. They're not. 1 John 1 9 confession is agreeing with God concerning our sin. It is us saying the same thing God says about our sin. It is us saying the same thing that God says about our sins, that He forgave them. The word is homologeo, to speak, to say the same thing as another. It isn't naming your sins. When we do that, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Christ cleanses us of all sin as we walk in the light of that fact or that truth. Forgiveness is a finished transaction. In Colossians 1 and, and Hebrews 2, we are reconciled. We were reconciled to God. We were His enemies. We weren't believing Him. We weren't serving Him. We weren't seeking Him. We were not looking to Him. We didn't love Him. Where you cannot argue is that there was none righteous, no, not one. Reconciliation is a finished transaction. The modern evangelistic movement leads you to believe that there is something that you must do if you are to go to heaven. And by that much, they demean the finished work of Christ. In Colossians 2.10, you are complete in Christ. You're not lacking anything. The truth, dearly beloved, concerning spiritual growth into maturity is that we are becoming ever more aware in our experience of that which is already true of us in Christ. You are holy. Now you may not look like it to yourself or to me, but God calls you a saint. Not only are you holy, you are unblameable and un unreprovable. The word holy is our word sanctified. In 1 Thessalonians 5, you are wholly sanctified, that different word, W-H-O-L-L-Y, wholly sanctified. You're sanctified wholly by God, not by you. In 2 Timothy 1 and Titus 3, you are delivered, you are saved. In Colossians 1 and in Hebrews 9, you have it an eternal inheritance, an everlasting inheritance. In Hebrews 10, you're perfected forever. And this, folks, is nowhere near it. It nowhere near describes the extent of Christ's perfect finished work. It nowhere near describes the amount of truth that Christians need to know to be delivered. That it, it is God's heart that they know these truths so that now that they have been redeemed they can be saved delivered this is what we're seeing in this context concerning Israel as well as the church how do I put into words that it is Christ who died in our place and rose again it's no wonder that, that theologians in past generations called it satisfaction he shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. That's where I'm limited in trying to present the finished work of Jesus Christ. As it's touched on in, in Romans 10.4, we surely are on holy ground. God Almighty taking upon himself the form of a servant made in the likeness of man and not dying so that we might have stuff, so that we might have something, but dying in our place so that we, so that we do have it. How much does modern 
thought defile and blaspheme the finished work of Christ. To add anything, to add anything by you in that much demeans the perfect finished work of Christ. If you have anything to do with redemption, Christ did not do enough. By that much, you have subtracted from the satisfaction in the travail of his soul. And I look upon that as the most horrible kind of blasphemy. To think that you could lose your redemption is to criticize the finished work of Christ. And Christians will say, oh no, I'd, I would never do that. It's just that, well, if I'm, I'm going to be in heaven, I have to do this or that or the other thing. When I was a kid, my folks didn't allow us kids to, to go see a movie. Well, why can't I see a movie? Well, uh, actors live horrible lives and you'd be supporting that terrible lifestyle. There was a, a pharmacist at our drugstore that ran off with one of the store clerks. So when my mom said she had to go to the drugstore, I suggested that she shouldn't go because if she did, she'd be supporting a terrible lifestyle. And I almost got spanked. Finally, it got to where we could go to the, to the most uh, boring movies, but not on Sunday. No, not on Sunday. Anybody going to a movie on Sunday would be going to hell. Uh, you can laugh at those things, but these are just shades of what goes on every day in Christianity. Someone asked me, you know, if I think a murderer can go to heaven, and I say, you mean like David? And I, I never hear back from this person again. You see what Christianity in the main is doing is exalting man and bringing down the finished work of Christ. Verse 5, For Moses describes the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. Verse 6, But the righteousness which is of faith speaks on this wise, Say not in thine heart, which the Jews would have recognized as you know, an evil thought, who shall ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down. Uh, I believe the word there is katago, to bring down from above. That is, do not question who belongs to God on the basis that they, that they did something when it's about what Christ did, which he will not do again. His sacrifice was sufficient, justified by the finished work of Christ. such a word of the heart pushes man up and pushes Christ down. The impossible task religion takes on is to ascend to heaven on its own merit, which is to bring down Christ, make what he did insufficient. A few examples would be the sacrifice of the mass, uh, purgatory, penance, all of these things demean the finished work of Christ. To say that he didn't do enough, imagine saying that Christ giving his life in your place was not enough. Well, you had it, then you lost it. You know, I, I couldn't count the number of people who have said to me, well, Steve, I had eternal life once. Folks, you can't lose something that you didn't work for, earn, or buy in the first place. There is no judgment for you who are in Christ. We all know what David did, yet he was a man after God's own heart. When you think that way, stop and think of what it will be like when David and Uriah meet in glory. I am in no way excusing the activities of the flesh, but I am exalting the finished work of Christ. Verse 7, Or who shall descend into the deep? That is, to bring up Christ again from the dead. I think what that's saying is do not question who belongs to God on the basis that they did something. When Christ was raised because we were made righteous by God, 
by the obedience of Christ. And he need not raise again. Propitiation, peace with God, no condemnation, justified freely by his grace, we stand before him spotless. The impossible task that religion takes on is to resurrect the flesh, try to clean up the old man, thinking that they can become uh, acceptable to God based upon human performance. Here's how a couple of commentators put it. One said, have I to procure incarnation and resurrection? No, all is now done. The person and the work are complete. Another commentator says, this were in effect to frustrate and make void the death of Christ. It is as much as, as to say he never died for us, or he must come again and suffer and shed his blood for the remission of our sins. He died to deliver us from death and damnation. He endured the wrath of God that we may escape it. The sense of the whole is this. The righteousness of the law speaks terror and it puts us into a continual fear of hell. But the righteousness of faith that speaks comfort forbids fear and troubles about our salvation or damnation. Another commentator says that Paul sees here that Christ's descent and ascent were so finished as to make the means of salvation a prepared and present reality to the believing soul. Verse 8, but what saith it? The word, and notice the word word here, the word is nigh thee even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed, for there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all. And that is his elect that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I'm telling you that only redeemed persons can call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. Which is God's desire for us now that we are redeemed. Just as we read in the opening verse of this chapter. Well, I'm out of time. This is Steve. I love you all. I truly do. Thanks for watching.